Hi there and welcome back to the channel. I'm Georgina and this is Art History Girl. Now I think some of you know and some of you don't know, but I just wanted to tell you that I'm actually having a baby on the 7th, well, due the 7th of August, um, which is really exciting. And I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. I personally think it's a boy, but apparently people's instincts are often wrong with these things, so we'll just have to wait and see. But I'm currently 33 weeks pregnant and I just wanted to show you my bump. So anyway, enough baby chat, we'll get on with today's video. And today we're looking at Moses. So Moses is a sculpture by the High Renaissance artist Michelangelo, and it was made somewhere between 1513 and 1515. It was commissioned by Pope Julius II as a tomb for when he died, but the design was never completed, and the sculpture ended up in the church of San Pietro in Vincioli in Rome. So who was Moses? Moses is considered the most important prophet in Judaism and a very important prophet in Christianity and Islam. Well, Michelangelo has shown him here as a very intimidating character. Not only does he have enormous arms and wear a very angry expression, he's also an absolute giant and he's nearly eight feet when sitting down. Under his right arm, he's carrying the tablets of the law and those are the stones inscribed with the Ten Commandments that he's just received from God on Mount Sinai. In this story from the Old Testament, Moses has just released the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, and he leaves them to go to the top of Mount Sinai. He stays there for 40 days and nights until he's given the Ten Commandments by God. When he returns, he finds the Israelites have built a golden calf to worship and make sacrifices to. It's thought that this behaviour is basically copying the Egyptians, who like to worship pagan or false idols. And one of the Ten Commandments Moses received is, Thou shalt not make any graven images. So when Moses saw the Israelites worshipping this idol and betraying the one and only God, who's just delivered them from slavery, he gets really angry, throws down the tablets and breaks them. So here's the passage in the Hebrew Bible. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. He held in his hands the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These stone tablets were God's work. The words on them were written by God himself. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting below them, he exclaimed to Moses, it sounds as if there was a war in the camp. But Moses replied, no, it's neither a cry of victory nor a cry of defeat. It's the sound of a celebration. And when they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing. In terrible anger, he threw the, threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. And what we can see in Michelangelo's sculpture is the figure's pent up energy. His pose is actually quite similar to the David in that he's been caught in that moment of anger. And it's actually the moment before he acts. Like the David as well, He's turning from the waist while his eyes are fixed on the Israelites, or in David's case, Goliath. But Moses isn't just sitting down. His left leg is pulled back to the side of his chair as though he's about to stand up, and his hips are also facing left. Michelangelo has counterbalanced this position by pulling his torso in the opposite direction, which has brought Moses to life, but also created a tension in his pose. And we can see this counterbalance again further up the sculpture. His head is turning to the left and he's pulling his beard to the right. By comparing Michelangelo's Moses to Donatello's sculpture of St John, we can see the difference between the early and the high Renaissance ideals and how they've evolved over time. Both are sitting down, but Donatello's relaxed figure of St John really lacks the power and the life of Michelangelo's sculpture and he's a much calmer, more passive figure. There's no dynamism, and you don't feel like he might spring into life in the same way that Michelangelo's Moses might. The fact that Moses is shown here as a living, breathing figure would have been seen as a reflection of God, alive and active in the 16th century. Giorgio Vasari wrote about Moses in the life of Michelangelo. He said, the beautiful face, like that of a saint and mighty prince, seems as one regards it to need the veil to cover it, so splendid and shining does it appear. 
And so well has the artist presented in marble the divinity with which God has endowed that holy countenance. And he also said that the Jewish community in 16th century Rome had adopted the figure and still go every Saturday in troops to visit and adore it as a divine, not a human thing. Even Sigmund Freud apparently spent several weeks in Rome trying to figure out the sculpture's emotional effect in 1913. And Joshua Jones, the well-known art critic for The Guardian, wrote, His anger defies the prison of stone, the limits of the sculptor's art. Few can resist the impression of a real mind, real emotions, in the figure that glares from his marble seat. Today he glares at the tourists who mob the church of San Pietro in Vincioli, Rome. Its power must have something to do with the rendition of things that should be impossible to depict in stone, most quirkily the beard, so ropey and smoky, its coils give fantastic snaking life. But the elephant in the room, or elephants, <laughs> are Moses' horns on his head. The tradition for depicting Moses with horns stems from a passage in the Latin Vulgate Bible, which describes Moses' face as cornuta, or horned. St Jerome had translated the Bible from Hebrew into Latin in the 4th century, and in his attempt to faithfully represent a text, it's possible that he mistranslated it. The original Hebrew text uses the term queran, which is based on the root queren, meaning horn. It's now translated in a more illustrative way. The term is thought to mean shining or emitting rays, a bit like horns of light. Although some historians think that Jerome made an outright error, Jerome himself seems to have known queren as a metaphor for glorified based on other texts he wrote, including one on Ezekiel, where he wrote that Moses' face had become glorified and not horned. In general, medieval theologists and scholars understood that Jerome had intended to convey Moses' face being glorified, and this can be proved by the fact that the next 150 years, there were very few depictions of a horned Moses in art. But after that, it seems as though some artists understood and some didn't. They took a more literal translation. So from then on, you began to see an increase in Moses depicted with horns. And these can be seen in the stained glass windows in Chartres Cathedral, in Saint-Chapelle and Notre Dame Cathedral. But by the 16th century, when Michelangelo was making the sculpture, a horned Moses had once again <laughs> become almost extinct as though there was an acknowledged tradition that he had been shown with horns, but also they seemed to know that it was perhaps intentional and meant rays of light. In 2008, another theory was published in a book called The Sistine Secrets. The authors actually argued that the sculpture never had horns, but it was meant to be high up, and therefore the artist had planned Moses as a masterpiece, not only of sculpture, but also of special optical effects worthy of any Hollywood movie. So they argued that the horns were meant to reflect light off them and cast shadows over Moses' face for maximum impact. This interpretation has been widely contested though. Jonathan Jones actually says that Michelangelo used the horns to give Moses an inhuman, demonic aspect. But why did Michelangelo create the Moses? In 1505, Pope Julius II commissioned him to create his tomb, having heard of Michelangelo's David, which was considered the most beautiful figure ever created and even exceeded the beauty of ancient Greek and Roman sculptures. This may seem a bit strange to us that great rulers throughout history decided to create their tombs while they were still alive, but it was pretty normal for them because they wanted to be able to be in control of something where they'd be remembered forever. So the plan was to construct a tomb in the new St Peter's Basilica, which had been designed by Bramante. It's thought that Michelangelo probably started the first drawings for the tomb in March, April 1505, and this first contract was going to cost 10,000 ducats. The tomb of Julius II was meant to be a three-storey, freestanding monument, and may have included as many as 47 large figures carved out of Carrara marble. The original plan was meant to represent an outline of the Christian world. The lower level was dedicated to man, the middle level dedicated to the prophets, 
and saints, and the top level was meant to surpass them all and be dedicated to the last judgment. So at the top of the monument, there was going to be two angels leading the Pope out of his tomb on the day of the last judgment. Michelangelo's process of creating the tomb of Julius II is often called the tragedy of the tomb because there were so many plans that were revised and it happened so many times that finally a much smaller scale tomb was completed. But it was actually Julius II who stopped this original plan from going ahead because he asked Michelangelo to pause the project and begin work on painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So that was quite a famous one. That happened between 1508 and 1512. And then not long after, in 1513, the Pope died. I think he can be pretty proud, though, of the legacy he left behind with the Sistine Chapel. But regardless of that, his heirs were left to renegotiate the new contracts for the tomb with Michelangelo. Finally, in 1542, his grandson negotiated the details and the tomb was completed in 1545, although it ended up in the church of San Pietro in Vincioli in Rome and not St Peter's as Julius intended. They also agreed that the tomb would be smaller and placed against a wall instead of being a freestanding sculpture. Moses is the only sculpture in the tomb which has been carved by Michelangelo. In the original plans, he would have been placed on the tier nearly four metres high and opposite a figure of St Paul. But in the final design, the sculpture sits at the bottom, in the centre of the massive monument. On either side of Moses are the sculptures of Rachel and Leah, and these were executed by Raffaello da Montelupo, a pupil of Michelangelo. He also completed allegories of the contemplative and the active life on the second tier. But the Virgin and Child, along with Pope Julius II himself, were sculpted by a less experienced pupil. I love that sculpture of St Julius lying at the feet of the Virgin and Child. You could just imagine he was messing around with like a crowd of football lads and decided to take a photo. So there you go, that's my video of Michelangelo's Moses. I think it's a fairly interesting sculpture actually and one that Michelangelo considered his most lifelike. So it's quite an important one in his eyes. Please remember to like and comment on this video if you haven't already and please subscribe if you'd like to see more. So I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. <laughs>